industry on parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Pittsburgh, a city that's working hard to clean up smog conditions. And on its outskirts, ragweed and other plants that contaminate the air with their pollen, affecting all citizens, but especially those who suffer from hay fever. Pittsburgh is by no means the only community where unfortunate citizens go through this agony each summer, or where housewives face this unpleasant chore. But where the air must be absolutely pure, as in the formula room of Children's Hospital, an answer to the problem has been found in an electronic air cleaner developed by Tryon Incorporated of McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania. The air must be cleared of not only dust and bacteria, but even radioactive particles, if there should be any in the atmosphere. The Tryon unit that accomplishes this does not merely strain the air, it utilizes an entirely different principle, giving the particles of matter a positive electric charge that causes them to adhere to metal plates carrying a negative charge. The result, sterility of the air. Museums and libraries in all parts of the country are also finding the equipment invaluable in protecting old masterpieces against the ravages of time, which are largely the ravages of impurities in the air. Books, too, are guarded against the dust and deterioration that no longer need be synonymous with age. Newest application of the Tryon air cleaners has been in homes, where much smaller units purify the air before feeding it through the furnace and out through registers into all parts of the house. The simplicity of the setup means practically no maintenance whatever. Meanwhile, under the direction of its youthful president, Bud Myers, Tryon plows back a great part of its income into an extensive research program aimed at finding new applications, improving performance, and reducing costs. Here in the lab, they demonstrate the principle of electrostatic precipitation. A charge is sent through the wire, and the smoke settles instantly on the metal foil around the sides. In the electric air filter, dust and dirt are collected on metal plates in the same way, to be washed down the sewer instead of settling on walls and furniture. Rather than wire and metal foil, of course, the parts of the unit are built of much sturdier stuff to handle thousands of cubic feet of air a day, every day. These are the plates on which the filtered material will settle. And here being assembled are the power packs which change ordinary house current to DC, then boost the voltage to the extremely high point necessary. This is accomplished without using any more electricity than is consumed by a 40 watt light bulb. And so, while industry generally takes the lead in the campaign to clear up the atmosphere in which we live, work, and play, one industry makes it possible to live comfortably and healthily no matter what the air is like outside making the interiors of such spanking new Pittsburgh structures as these pure and clean as that hospital room in which they prepare the baby's formulas. As pleasant on the inside as they are beautiful from without. Today's frontiersman does not wear a coonskin cap or shoulder a hunting rifle. More likely he's wearing a laboratory apron with a stirring rod. His hunting is done with a microscope. The scientist and engineer working with the businessman tamed the wilderness with steamboats and railroads, provided harvesters to cut the prairie grain and feed a growing nation. Scientists harnessed the power of rivers, coal, and oil and helped give Americans high-quality, mass-produced goods. Yes, today America's new frontiers are in science. Here 
here's a scene that has long since ceased causing any surprise. The women folk washing dishes made of plastic. Dishes that bounce when they drop to the floor. Hard to realize it, but it was only 10 years ago that the first pound of polyesterine plastic was sold. And it was sold by Arnold Martinelli at Left. At that time, a salesman for Monsanto, and now the owner of his own firm, the Rogers Plastic Corporation of West Warren, Massachusetts. In a 10-year-old industry, a six-year-old firm is a veteran. And already, Rogers is a leader in the production of household wares which are molded on machines like this under a method called jet injection. The molten polyesterine is forced into precision molds under great pressure and immediately hardens into the exact shape of the mold. Mr. Martinelli, who himself operated the first machine his company bought, can still hold his own on the production line and occasionally does. Here we see coasters being packed for shipment. And in a matter of minutes, the line could be producing water tumblers or tomato slicers, bread boxes or pitchers. It's this rapid adaptability, together with the attractiveness, usefulness, and low cost of the plastic itself, that has made this industry one of the fastest growing in the nation's history. The future of plastics is bright indeed. And Rogers is a company that intends to stay out in front, broadening still further its already extensive line of products made of plastic. What's cooking in this industrial laboratory at Duncan, Oklahoma? Well, none of the scientists and engineers of the Halliburton Oil Well Cementing Company will say much about projects still in the works. But you can be sure every bit of the research and preparation carried on here is aimed in just one direction, toward the sinking of bigger, better, more productive oil wells. Like the million or more wells the men of Halliburton have already helped bring in and kept producing during the past quarter century. Drilling an oil well is a highly complex business in which the drillers must depend on a wide variety of special skills and equipment. Halliburton crews stand by at strategic points wherever oil is welled, ready to rush to the spot at which their services are needed, usually in a hurry. They could be called for a hydrofact job to force openings in oil-bearing sand formations through which the oil can flow into the well or perhaps an electrical logging operation to determine whether the well is likely to produce oil at all. But this crew has been summoned to perform Halliburton's oldest and best known service, well cementing. What they're about to do is pump cement down into the well between the metal casing and the wall of the hole. The reason? There are several reasons. To support and protect the well casing prevent the contamination of fresh water deposits, to guard against the well being blown out by high pressure gases found below ground, and other reasons. In developing its services, Halliburton has perfected a great many pieces of equipment that have become indispensable in oil field operations. The manufacture and sale of such equipment has become an important part of the firm's business. But when it comes to jobs like cementing, the drillers find it far more economical to leave the job to the Halliburton crews themselves. Into the hopper goes the dry cement. The method of mixing bulk cement with water under pressure was developed by the company's founder and made this essential step in oil drilling feasible. The jet mixer combines water and cement and the resulting slurry is pumped hundreds or even thousands of feet underground to form a concrete wall around the well hole. America's great petroleum industry is dependent on the skills, the research, the investment of time and money of specialists like Halliburton, who press constantly forward with the search for new, more efficient ways of getting oil out of the ground.
Since Americans enjoy the highest standard of living in the world, we must make sure that any changes in our system are going to increase this standard rather than decrease it, and that whatever happens to our system will benefit us in the three roles most of us play. In working for a living, each of us helps to produce a product or a service. We all buy products and services produced by others, and most of us put something aside in bank accounts, insurance policies, stocks, or bonds. Remember, Better living standards depend on all of us. Air raid alarm down on the farm? No, he's just calling in the cows, 20th century style. And how they come running in response to this latest addition to the mechanized farm of today. Just one of the more than 20 types of electric horns produced by the Jubilee Manufacturing Company of Omaha. But even the production of such a supposedly simple item as an auto horn calls for a wide assortment of special tools and personnel trained to operate them. Huge presses blank, stamp, form and draw the sheet steel into the many parts of an electric horn. The parts are welded, bolted, or riveted into sub-assemblies, which will later be brought together into the finished product. Here, feminine fingers assemble the horn motor, the part that makes the noise. In all, between 150 and 200 separate parts will go into each instrument. Last to go into the motor are brackets, gaskets, and the diaphragm, whose vibrations give off the sound. Now the motor assembly is riveted to the projector that will shoot the sound in the right direction. Air-powered screwdrivers and wrenches add the final twist, and when the wiring has been installed inside the dome, the horn will be ready for its coat of lacquer. Jubilee's experience dates back through nearly half a century of manufacturing and includes production of such long outdated items as crystal radio sets and parts for the old Model T Ford. Out of the infrared drying oven come the horns, all set to be packed and shipped all over the world. We've seen and heard the cattle collar horn in action now let's hear a horn that may not have as much appeal for cows, but sounds a lot better to these human ears. <laughs> 